Okay, we'll get going now. With uh, information from uh, Univision News Digital's uh, video projects from Amudena Taral, who is the head of uh, video projects for uh, Univision. And she is also a multiple, multiple uh, video and photo award winner. And uh, the 2019, was it World? What was the, the most recent? World Press Photo, World Press photo uh, Video uh, uh, Award winner. So uh, she is obviously going to be talking to us about reaching multiple audiences and, and way, you know, strategies for doing that. So Almodena, thank you. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, how many of you know what Univision is? I imagine mostly everyone. OK. <laughs> um, just to give a bit of um, context, of course, you all know it's a, a Hispanic broadcast station, one of the two large ones in the US, together with Telemundo. And I work for the uh, digital division of the broadcast station. We do national news, collaborate with locals sometimes as well. And um, our audience is a little bit different than other audiences from other outlets because it's even more on mobile than other outlets as far as I know. It's almost 90% of our audience access us through mobile. That's not, that's separate from the traditional audience that sits down at 6.30 to watch the newscast, if that makes sense. And then the audience is traditionally first generation immigrants. They speak Spanish, don't speak a lot of English. Second generation immigrants, that's they speak English and Spanish alterating, some of them speak better English than Spanish. And then we see as obviously as the demographics continue to change in the US with Hispanics here, we're trying to grapple with that question of how do we access uh, and how do we inform audiences in both languages, what projects we strategize for one language versus the other, how do we try to capture new audiences, especially with the political landscape right now, and I'll talk more about that. And one other thing that is different from other um, news outlets in English is that we still see a high degree of trust with the audience and the brand. So for example, I, I, I mean, I'm still quite puzzled all the time to see how the main Univision anchors really, really are rock stars, whatever they go in the US. So Jorge Ramos might go to a small village in the, in the Midwest and people love him and trust him and that is wonderful, of course. Um, so I had a small team within our digital division that does mostly video but also photography and sort of like de facto coordinate special projects for the digital division. So I always talk about how working on a visual team gives us such an edge compared to other teams because we have that universal language that we can use to appeal to our audience and to especially tap into audiences in multiple languages. Uh, I remember when I first started this job, it's about four and a half years ago, the digital, we had a big digital expansion about five years ago. And um, we run into a lot of cultural issues, right? And cultural issues, I'll, I, I had worked in newspapers and magazines before in their digital departments. And it was my first time working at a broadcast station. And what I found as a visual person, somebody who does photography and video, I thought, oh, this is going to be much easier because people on TV already understand what video is. It's a visual medium. And my surprise was that it was actually a bigger culture shock because the video languages that we use are very different. And within our digital team that we created that it ended up being up to 100 people, we also had cultural shocks 
within the little teams within our digital team. So we had an infographics team, a data team, a video team, then we had writers, and it's sort of like we went through a period where we had to understand to understand each other. And we did, um, we did a few trainings that helped a lot, so empowered people from the broadcast side, for example, to train us visual digital people to be able to film things that would be valuable for them as well in certain assignments. We did the opposite. We tried to train broadcast on our visual language, and we still do that to a certain degree, and there's been a lot of cultural change for the good. I have never seen an organization that is so hyped about what's coming next and new visual languages on the broadcast side. At least I've, we've seen a lot of a lot of like cultural change that way. So for example, some examples, uh, this is on the upper left. This is an example from the last um, elections. And um, our infographics team on the digital side created all these tools that then uh, our news anchors on broadcast were able to use on live TV. And that was a major breakthrough in terms of the TV saying, oh, they can do stuff we can't. This is so cool. Then on the lower left side, is uh, we created a newscast that is still going. Um, it's run now entirely from the, the TV broadcast side that airs only on digital and social platforms uh, at noon all the time. And it's quite popular, uh, and it has held strong for, I think, about uh, two or three years now. And also, we've had, on the upper right side, it's a video that we filmed on mobile um, on a breaking news coverage on the digital side, and it ended up airing on uh, primetime newscasts. So there's been a lot of back and forth in terms of quality, of course, as like cameras get better and all of that. We've seen stuff on films on cell phones, broadcasting on TV. On the uh, lower right, it's an image that I myself filmed on a phone for a short documentary that also aired on TV and ended up winning an Emmy. So this particular scene, for example, it was mostly filmed on a phone. And uh, everything changed a lot for us the day uh, Donald Trump became president. Up until then, um, we thought about our audience as in Spanish. Spanish is still the main language of our audience and the main language of most of our content. All of our content in broadcast and most of our content in Spanish. But here we had a president that directly attacked the community we cover. So they call them criminals and rapists and told all these lies. And we thought there was a certain degree of responsibility as journalists that we had, not only to inform our audience in these critical times, to give them information that would help them make better decisions, but also to give them a voice outside of our little bubble, right? It's like give them a voice in the national conversation. So we started thinking more seriously in digital we have to be very strategic with doing certain projects in English. So making sure that they reach that type of audience that might not hear from certain Latinos, for example, that often. So this is one of the first projects we did um, when he, actually we decided to do this project the day after he got elected. And it was published a month, it was published when he was inaugurated on January. It was a little experiment uh, in VR. They didn't like let us say bye to him or anything, they just took him. Venís aquí por necesidades. No es venís por gusto. ¿Qué va a pasar con nosotros? So it was a little 360 VR series that we did, uh, profiling different undocumented immigrants whose legal cases had been protected from deportation under Obama and were going to be directly targeted by Trump. So one of them was a dreamer, another one was an elderly farmer that had a crime from 25 years ago. 
And we had not done anything on 360 or VR, so this was, this was like a first big push. And uh, I'm talking about this project because I think it's important to talk about the projects that you do to experiment, but then you sort of like stop experimenting. And this was a good example. We did a few other things in 360 and VR, but uh, we eventually decided it wasn't worth the effort with our limited resources. I think part of that was the whole accessibility issue that we were talking about before. Our audience wasn't really uh, used to watching VR. Actually, one of the comments in YouTube, one of my favorite ones was like, why does it feel that I'm like I'm on the video in Spanish? Um, so there was a little bit of education that we tried to do, but it, it didn't really um, it didn't really hang. This is another project that we did um, a few months after this one. It was 2000, the end of 2017, before all the news outlets uh, in English were publishing about uh, the Central American refugee crisis. We did the this dive gone with. Um, uh, digital newspaper in El Salvador, El Faro, it has a really high reputation in Central America, so we decided to partner with them. And in this project, we tried to, it was really massive. Um, they, the newspaper in El Salvador specializes on long form narrative texts. They're really amazing writers. So we had these long form narrative texts that we ended up um, turning into audiobooks. Uh, we had a lot of really great photography that we decided to format square because we had been experimenting with different digital projects on if it was better received square or not square. We had different types of uh, video uh, from like cinemagraphs to documentaries to animation to trying a, lo a lot of things with design. One of the things that we tried to do for user experience in this case, knowing that we were going to do this project in English as well as in Spanish, was we had in the text a lot of words that were slang in Central America, in El Salvador. So we had this little tool where you could click on specific words and get a little definition. And how we translated that visually, for example, in this case, to Instagram stories, was doing these little, um, very simple Instagram stories in Spanish. This one's actually uh, with those same definitions of the words. And this actually had a lot of uh, engagement and were really well received. These are other Instagram stories that we did for a different chapter in the big project. It had five books or audio books, so it was pretty massive. And we tried to experiment with information that, that was in the project or wasn't in the project with the uh, Instagram stories. With the longer videos, we really did try to target the evergreen. So we did a lot of thinking about what are we going to do that can last longer than the week when the project gets published. And actually, uh, we hit it pretty well. Some of the videos are over a million views right now. And of course, it's of course a, a theme and a topic that is very relevant in the news cycle. So both in English and Spanish, these videos have not died. This one is a, an explainer that we did with the journalists in El Salvador on the origin of the gangs in Central America. And it keeps on racking up views. And this is a little short documentary that we did with a, another broadcast journalist El Salvador in El Salvador. Tiene una Ellos mismos han puesto un dicho, ver, oír y callar. Han emigrado de aquí por la violencia. Obligadamente, vea. Estamos solos en esta guerra declarada con la pandilla. Si no tengo la pistola debajo de la almohada, tengo que estarla casi tocando para dormir. A ese grupo de periodistas que trabajan en la madrugada les dicen tecolotes. Es una ave nocturna parecida al búho. I'll just stop it there so we can watch some more stuff. 
We did a lot of experiments as well with turning. This was the time when IGTV was only vertical. Um, so no, we did a tierra. lot of experiments when it hablando. first came out, turning our documentaries Horror, for this agua. project into vertical, which required reversioning, of no course. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. This is another project that we did, we published actually only a few months ago, uh, this year, about gender-based violence in El Salvador and how it relates to uh, people coming to the U.S. to ask for asylum. It was a different way into this story. And the reason why I wanted to show this project is because we have been doing a lot of thinking with trying to protect sources. We are a visual team, so we do photography and video, and showing people's faces is what we do. The reality is, like, especially after Trump became president, it's been no joke. Like, we've had a lot of instances where we have to think clear and hard about how some people are in danger if they give a face to the camera. And this is an extreme example in that, of course, it's very clear why in this case you wouldn't show the faces of girls who are dying, who have tried to die by suicide, right? But it extends to a whole range of projects that we've been doing um, tackling immigration in the U.S. as well, where we have to grant, I won't say anonymity because you're still hearing them and you're still going uh, with them, but you, you need to find ways visually to protect sort of like their identity. And this was a whole 10 minute documentary that we did without showing a single face, which I'm still quite amazed at uh, that we managed to do that. I'm just gonna show a little. Uh, Solo like, veo los árboles que son diferentes, personas que son diferentes. No estamos acostumbrados a lo frío como es aquí. Y la paz que se siente al no sentirse perseguido uno. Tenía miedo a que él me matara. Aquí en Estados Unidos yo me siento más segura. He visto miles de muertos. En nuestro país, en El Salvador, a la niña le toca enfrentar muchísimos retos. Son víctimas de acoso y abuso sexual, no solamente por pandillas, sino que por su misma condición de niñas. Me sentía sola, me sentía desamparada. A los seis años se murió mi papá. Después de eso, mi mamá solo se dedicó a tomar, a tomar. No les dejaba nada que comer. Mi hermano era de una pandilla. Con ese dinero que le daban, los ayudaban nosotros. So the rest of the documentary, it's online. You can watch the rest. Um, but it basically mixes both illustration and animation and real life images from uh, Maria and other girls, both in Central America and in the US. And um, these are some screenshots from both still photography and video images that we had on the, on the digital experience. I, for example, now, whenever I go to any um, coverage, I always try to take a macro lens with me, precisely because of this issue. We do more and more filming with a macro lens. So, for example, the image on the left is a six-year-old girl who had tried to commit suicide and we basically at the end we didn't have the heart to do a full interview with her of course but we did uh, play with her a little bit and we got a little uh, a few shots with the macro lens where obviously you can't quite tell at all that it's her so that was useful um, and then I mean tried to think more and more about shadows and uh, other creative vehicles to be able to tell these stories. This is a little photo gallery that we did that did okay. Um, trying to come at the 
trying to tackle the issue that is obviously very hard and nobody really wants to think about girls suiciding. And we tried to ask all of them, will you write in a napkin why do you try to kill yourself? And then we ended up doing a little photo gallery with that, thinking it was at least a little attempt to not reveal their identities, but still you can tell that girl in the left is really, really young. So it was a different way that some audiences got to interact with the issue. Then, of course, we had a lot of graphics, both still and interactive, that always work really well with our audience. And then we, in social media, we oftentimes move the graphics separately or find ways to interact with the audiences that way. Um, this is another project that I wanted to talk about um, because it, it started as one thing and then it grew out of proportion, basically. We did this 42-minute documentary um, last year about an immigration raid in 2008. And we did that looking at, obviously, Trump had ramped up all the immigration raids in work sites specifically. And the example of what happened in this town over 10 years ago we thought was very revealing and had some lessons for the present. So this was a project that started like, let's do a 10-minute documentary and we'll dig into some data. And it ended up being a 42-minute documentary. We got outside financing for it as well. And with this one specific project, I think I'm not going to show the clip out of illegal immigration time. We, we thought a lot about how do we not only have this documentary that airs on broadcast and airs on uh, digital, and we try to, of course, it has been very evergreen as well because immigration rates are still a thing of the present. But we also made a lot of effort with partnerships and tried to get it in front of other audiences that are not traditionally ours. So we partnered with The Intercept for the launch of the film in English. We screened it in a lot of film festivals, including a community um, festival in the town where the documentary was filmed in Iowa. And we partnered especially with radio and podcast uh, because we thought that was a way to reach, again, different audiences. And a lot of people actually learned about these through Radio Ambulante or NPR rather than watching the show. So that was a really interesting exp experiment for us. And then... Este programa es en inglés, pero si lo quieres leer en español, aprieta aquí. There is nothing that immigrants fear the most than rates, redadas, and during the Trump administration, those raids have multiplied, disrupting many families and many communities. And when those communities are composed by farm workers that harvest food like this, then everyone is affected. I remember reporting about a raid in Allen, Texas, probably the largest raid in a decade. But tonight we're going to O'Neill, Nebraska, a community that was seriously affected by a raid last August in which more than 100 so people a were detained. Was this was created is and is still going for Facebook Watch, which, uh, of course, it's a big revenue generator Univision got in the first Facebook Watch promotion of outlets and whatnot. And it's all vertical. It's filmed 4K horizontal. But uh, I mean, because the anchor is Jorge Ramos, he receives a uh, huge audience. So it was another way of getting uh, specific digital projects in front of other audiences, reversioning or making specific stories for that show. And this is another clip that I wanted to show of another show that was created specifically for Instagram TV on Vertigo with Patricia Janiot, that is another big anchor at Univision. And now the second season starting, of course, in horizontal rather than vertical because Instagram TV started doing horizontal. So there's a lot of talking about, do we film vertical, horizontal? With most of the times we film horizontal and then crop. Um, this documentary we created using both mobile and uh, Sony cameras. But we also do, I wanted to talk about these because we do a lot of thinking these days as well about how 
how does a project that is created for mobile audiences, originally in our case, uh, more and more screening bigger TVs. These uh, documentaries, the one that were uh, that won the World Press Photo Award this year, and is touring around the world in exhibitions. And I certainly think that yo lo mordí como yo quis, como yo soñaba, como yo no pude ser. For us. Illustration and animation are huge story enablers. No there are certain stories that we can't tell at all if we don't use illustration and animation. The clips, from the, left are, the clips from the left are a good example. This is a story we did uh, about migrants traveling in trucks crossing the Mexico-US border. And there's no way, I mean, that these immigrants were going to be able to give the face. So obviously being able to illustrate that story and do it in cards made it very appealing for the audience and for the audience in English as well to know about an issue that wasn't very well known. This little clip that I was showing was a square clip that we used to promote a bigger documentary. Um, and then we also use animation as part of uh, other like videos that use re regular image, but animation does very well for us in terms of promoting the content through social media and getting people to go to the project we've found than regular images. So we'll experiment sometimes with that as well. This is a little clip from a video from a, a Hurricane Maria project. And illustration, we've also done a lot of efforts with public service type of very evergreen know your rights videos. These are only, we only do them in Spanish because of course it doesn't make any sense to do them in English. These are for undocumented immigrants and basically to let them know what to do if ICE comes to the door. And these were done, I think, three years ago. And we've, I mean, we've, we've shared them, of course, on and on and on. And they keep on being relevant. So more to the evergreen, the case for the evergreen. Our infographics team, our audience responds like really, really, really well to infographics. So that's something that we've been trying to interact more with the video and the infographics team and how to work together. And um, these are a few other special projects that we did that encompass sort of like different media from 360 to photo to video to text to um, all of that. And these are some more. And I just wanted to talk about how we've been, as a team that does sort of like special projects, uh, we've done a lot of thinking about how to reconsider project by project, have a better strategy, better planning about what's the outcome that we want from each project, what are the metrics that we're looking at, because of course, Univision is a for-profit company, so there's a lot of pressure for metrics, and but there's also a lot more other things that some of these projects can add. And I think if the business and the editorial align themselves on with this project we're going for brand or for X or establishing really clearly what the metrics for each project are, we've been trying to get better and better at that. And I think it's uh, really key. And uh, some lessons learned on working for, on visuals for mobile is obviously we still pay a lot of attention to close-ups and super close-ups. Uh, it's definitely not about the camera, except if you're trying to do uh, documentaries for Netflix, which more news outlets are. Uh, but it's definitely about the eye and with the cameras that we have now with our mobile phones, there's really a lot that can be done in a very discreet way. Of course, subtitles keep on being super important, not only for us with our audiences, we subtitle everything in both languages um, when we can, but it's just like the nature of our audience watching on when they're commuting and whatnot. And then when we're designing some of these projects, we're thinking more and more about, of course it's mobile first, but then we run into all these discussions about 
well, the project looks really bad on an iPhone X, but it looks really good on an iPhone 5, right? And that's where a lot of the discussions are these days. Is like for us, our audience is mostly on an iPhone 5 or 6. So we're prioritizing that, actually. And some of our projects look really bad on an iPhone X, but you have to compromise. So that's a discussion also to, to be had these days. And then, of course, collaboration with any of these projects. This is not a one-person job. This is collaboration. And the more you collaborate and the better a team is greased to be able to work diplomatically and different teams to work diplomatically, I think the better results you have. That's all. Both get one. Um, so I just have a question because I like to do travel documentary work. So for, I don't speak Spanish fluently or anything like that, but are, do you guys hire freelancers or people who like to do documentary journalism? Um, are you looking for people to go out and shoot the video or do you guys kind of have that all covered or do you look for outside work for help or anything like that? Yeah, we've gone back and forth with the use of um, freelance documentarians and filmmakers. At the beginning, when, I, when we first started the team, we did a lot more work with freelancers and um, I did a lot more work, for example, on the, on the uh, editorial management part of all of that work. And we did a few like, video series that were entirely filmed by freelancers in different parts of Latin America, for example. And then all that footage would be edited in-house or whatnot. Um, but as time has gone by, we've sort of like moved away from that model because it was very time intensive on the newsroom part as well. So we've sort of moved to a model where we create more things in-house and we have a few selected like filmmakers or documentarians that we really trust. And then when we have to outsource something, we are more, more likely to outsource it to those people. That doesn't mean that we are not looking for always for talent. And if there's someone that's amazing, I'm always like looking into collaborating with more people. But the reality is like because we're a very small team, we have to be very strategic about what we do in-house, what we outsource, and especially how do we do quality control over everything. I had a question about the animation. Is that all done in-house or is there a program that helps you with it? Yeah, um, we are extremely lucky that we have an amazing illustrator and animator in-house that is, I call him a magician because he really is. He films beautifully, edits, can illustrate, animate, so he does a lot of our work. We had two, but we actually lost one of them to layoffs last year, which is a different chapter. But yeah, we do most, most of when we decide to do illustration and animation, we mostly do in-house or with a selected group of freelancers that we also know. So um, yeah, unfortunately, as far as I know, there's no software program that can still do these amazing things. <laughs> Um, you had mentioned early on in the presentation um, a, a digital-only video program that I think was broadcast at noon. Um, what was what I was curious about is what made you decide to make it an appointment viewing? You know, like what made you decide to actually set a time that it's released? And do you feel like that was important to its success versus just basically kind of putting it up for anyone to kind of watch more on demand? Yeah, it's still available on demand after. So it's just like, it just airs at noon, but then people can still watch it later. So the noon thing, uh, I mean, I actually wasn't involved in the creation of that show. We helped, that show is run from the broadcast side, but of course we helped our broadcast colleagues with the, a few, I wouldn't call it modernization things, but they, they were trying to do a show that was a little bit different, right, for, for uh, social platforms. So I think they initially created it for noon because they saw with the schedules of their newscasts, they saw that was a time when people were 
with an audience study. We're looking for Univision content on um, social platforms, and they wanted to have a presence with a younger voice. The anchors are younger and whatnot. So I think it has had success, which at the beginning not everybody thought it would. Honestly, it was an experiment, and then it stuck. I think part of it is like a lot of people connect at that time because they look for Univision content at that time. But then it's also on demand, so people can watch later. So it's a little bit of an old school idea, but. What is the, and I might have missed the beginning, the ultimate, like, what is the future vision for Univision? Like, do you want to grow or do you guys plan, where is the next plan, the next step um, for you guys to be? For the whole company? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, you, if you know for the company, because right now I know you said you're small and you had layoffs and everything, but I mean, what I'm watching is it's really interesting and I like seeing stuff like that. I know a lot of people who don't know, like you said, their rights or if ice comes to the door and that's something people can share and like, this is what you do, so... Um, do yeah. you guys have a goal in mind you're working at? or? Uh, I can't really speak about that. Uh, I mean, of course, it's public knowledge that the company's up for sale. So I have no idea where we will go, but I hope and trust that, of course, it will be much better in the future. And what I can definitely say is that the community really needs the information. So that it's, it's the moment to be serving this community for sure. I didn't know that, so sorry. <laughs> Thank you. If you had to estimate kind of the, the, the share of where people are actually coming to you from, like is it, what's the split between um, traditional TV or you know, cable TV coverage versus um, some of your digital platforms? Do you kind of know? Does it seem like, I mean, does it seem like it's shifting? Is it shifting rapidly? Is it shifting unexpectedly? Um. It is shifting rapidly. Uh, Univision is very interesting because compared to other broadcast networks, for example, the big ones in English, like CNN, ABC, CBS, um, I think they, they have seen all of broadcast networks in general, I think, have had a slower shift to digital because the ratings were still very high, right? But with CBS and some of the others in English, we see their population is aging very rapidly, honestly. So they're soon going to die. In Univ Univision, it's interesting because the broadcast audience for the newscast is younger, right? It's first generation immigrants, in many cases, workers, they're younger, 30s, 40s, 50s. But that said, they have seen the ratings uh, declining a little slower than other broadcast stations, but it is happening across the board. So they're not an exception. So obviously a lot of this push for digital has also come in terms of like the need to modernize the company and reach uh, the audience where they are, and a lot of the experiments that we do with different audiences in different languages is obviously only in digital, because in broadcast it doesn't make any sense. It's only in Spanish, and that's the very traditional Univision audience that is still there, but as the population shifts, we see more and more people accessing the information through the app and through mobile. All right. Thank All right. you, Aladana. That's Thank just you, fascinating. Everyone.